Welcome back to this episode of the Women and Money Cafe. Okay, I'm dead excited about today's episode because it's been on the schedule for quite some time. First had the idea a couple of months ago and now we're finally here. This one's going to be explosive. Okay, we're talking today about bias in financial services and God knows there's enough of it. But before we get down and dirty with it, I felt that it would make sense, first of all, to explain why this episode came about. And it started off, as while I was doing my coach training at coach school, and they make you go away and think about what your biases are. We're not allowed to do it together because apparently there'd be a fight. So we all went off to have a think about what our biases were. And I did that reflecting thing. So you start off with, well, what do I think is good? And I thought of all the things I think are good, because that means that the opposite of that, I'm going to think is bad, which means I've got a bias towards it. So it all started quite gentle because I think structure's good. So when someone's been unstructured, I'm going to automatically think that's bad and it's not necessarily the case. It could be good for that person. It's just, I don't like her. So that's all quite tame, isn't it? But me being me, I had to go a little bit deeper. I right, right, okay, what other biases have I got? And I sat there and I reflected. And I think it's not long after we'd had some guests on at the start of the year. And we had all kinds of different genders and sexuality on the podcast. But what struck me was that we were all white women. And I had to sit there and think, okay, what the hell's going on here? That every guest we've had on, just about every guest is a white woman. And I did the reflection and I realized that there's all kinds of screwy things going on in my head. One of them was, and I had this conversation with another advisor, is I had it in my head that black women wouldn't be interested in anything I had to say. Now, I actually had this conversation with a black financial advisor, and it turns out she said, I thought the same about white women. I thought, bloody hell, all this time we could have been talking to each other if we'd just been aware that this is a thing that goes on in our head. And so that kind of sent me off on a mission to sort of, once you know what you've got a bias, you become aware of it and you can take action kind of, to address it. So that's what we're doing in today's episode. And I'm really pleased to say that along with Michelle, hi, Michelle. Hi, Julie. I've got one of my new friends that I met th- along the way on this journey joining us today, and that is Bavisha. Hi, Bavisha. Hi, Jenny. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Bavisha. For the benefits of the listeners, do you want to just sort of tell us a little bit about yourself before we crack on? Yeah, sure, Julie. I am a chartered financial planner, and I work for a company in London, and I predominantly like to work with women and make them empowered and take their own financial decisions. So I've been in the industry for around 10 years now. All right. Thank you very much for that. So Vivisha, you and I had a really, really good conversation about this, didn't we, a while back? And that's when we thought this would make a brilliant podcast episode, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, we did. So it's funny, before we started recording, I was asking Michelle and Vivisha, should I share that story about how I ended up going on a big diversity run? For the podcast. Isha, you were saying that I should talk about it. Yes, yes, I feel it is very powerful and you will be saying what a lot of people would be thinking. So I, I feel that you should go ahead and share. All right, I don't know about you, Michelle, but I, it is a little bit uncomfortable doing it because like I've realized I've got this thing and I'm trying to do something about this thing. But then you're like, should I say anything about this thing? What if I say something offensive? What if I say something wrong? What if I say something that makes it worse? Should I not just shut up and deal with that? But any well, thoughts? Think, yeah, I mean, I can understand where you come from because I think we all have biases and they're uncomfortable because... It could be for many reasons that we have bias, but it, it is uncomfortable. And if we think a certain way, sometimes we just want to maybe try and correct that, like you said, and just go away and do that quietly. But I do think it's important that we bring it out and we talk about it because it's about everyone knowing that their biases are normal. We all have them. You'd be very, I've yet to meet someone who doesn't have a bias in any area of their life. So I know I think it's important to share it and I think it's important to talk about it. No, and I think you made a really important thing there is like it, every single person on the planet has a bias. It's not possible to live and function 
with those biases because what they are basically is is heuristics and it's shortcuts the brain can use to be able to function in the world. Without them, nothing would ever get done. But it's just some of them aren't that helpful. And we just inadvertently, by following these brain shortcuts, we exclude people without realizing it and without meaning to. But I think once we're aware of it, if we can get brave and start having these conversations, then it's just making it a little bit easier to be welcoming to more people. And I think, you know, without getting on my soapbox too much, we both, we all know that's the thing, right? We've got a bloody gender wealth gap. It's an issue. So we need to talk about these things so that we can start to break down some of this bias and some of these barriers that people are experiencing. So, Pavisha, I was wondering if you would feel comfortable maybe sharing a story that you shared with me about your experience of going networking. Sure, Julie. So I always dreaded networking. Like, and I've also listened to one of the podcasts then by Julie. And it was just an eye-opener. And I had several conversations about networking with Julie. And I thought, okay, it's all in my head that I realized after speaking to Julie. So I go into a networking event walk up to the steps, reach to the door with full confidence. And as the door opens and I just feel like, what am I going to talk about? I have got nothing in common with these people in the room. Half of them are men who would mostly talk about football and I've got no interest in football. And half are women who are born and brought up in the UK. Just to give you a little bit of context about this is I have not been born and brought up in the UK. I was born and brought up in, in India. I came here to do my higher education. I did my master's here, which is how I landed in the UK. And since then, I work in one industry or the other and then joined financial services. So my upbringing and my childhood have different memories than people compared to people in the UK. So I thought I've got nothing in common what am I going to talk to these people about? And I just do not have any topics which will make proper conversation, basically. And I had this whole thing in my head that I don't know what to talk to people about altogether. And that's when I spoke to Julie and she said, well, it's an interesting story. So you can bring in your own shared experience about how it was Bringing up in, you know, how it was growing up in India and then how, what was your journey like and share it with people over here, which is a great insight into a different perspective as well. But it is in my head, like, I don't know what to talk about. I don't have same, if you have watched sitcoms when you were young, I haven't watched those sitcoms. And if you talk about, I don't know, some fools and horses or whatever. I've got nothing. I don't know who the fool is and who the horse is. But is it? <laughs> so I just feel like idly and I don't have any topics to make proper conversation. And that's how our, our conversation evolved, isn't it, Julie? That you've got certain set pieces in your head, which you build those pieces as you are growing up. And that leads to you being biased, not necessarily you are biased. It's just your beliefs, which leads you into having those biases as well. And I think the irony I find is that you were telling me this story and I just thought, well, one, like I think everybody knows how I feel about networking. It, but it's everybody's defaulting to this small talk conversation because it's what's comfortable for them. But their very act of doing that excluded you. And it just mm -hmm. got me thinking, how often are we doing that with so many different people in so many different situations on any daily basis? Now, fortunately, I don't do small talk. I only do big talk. So I'm going to exclude the people that only like to do small talk, and that's okay with me. I can live with that one. But I just thought it was really interesting because you've got such a rich and different experience to everybody else in the room that wouldn't they want to hear about this? No, of course. It, I realized that after I spoke to you in one of our sessions, really, that it is something that I should be able to share and talk about more but I just had in my head that nobody wants to listen to that is my bias really more than anybody else's bias if I'm honest saying nobody wants to hear about this and what am I going to talk about it 
there are a lot of elements and a lot of factors that lead into me having that bias, but that is definitely my bias. And I'm since our conversation, I have been into events and I go and I talk to people and I talk about different things and I have tried to address that bias that I have more mm-hmm. than anything else. And I always used to think that people have some biases towards me because I look slightly different. I don't have same conversation. I've got an accent and they can pick up on these things and they might talk to me differently. And that was another bias that was that grown from this bias saying that you don't have anything in common with these people. So Mm. these are different things that, well, one is leading into another, to another really. And you just feel after a certain while that these, this is your normal, but it's mm. not. It's actually a bias. So <laughs> that's that's my experience. I know, and it's yeah. funny because as in, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm remembering where mine came from because it wasn't enough for me to just be aware that I had it. I had to know why I had it. And it's like where I grew up, it was incredibly white in the middle of England. I was the most exotic thing in the town because I'm Scottish. And there was only, there was one boy in the school who was black and he was super, super cool, right? And I'm not, I never have been super, super cool. So I think I've just not been exposed to talking to people from different sort of ethnicities and colours and backgrounds, except for I, there was that one super cool person. And so I've taken that into my head that black people aren't interested in anything I've got to say because they're all super cool and I'm not. And, that's, and I've had that since I was about eight. It does. Work. I can. Yeah. I can be super cool sometimes, though. Not often. So <laughs> it's just. But now that I've done that, I've I've struck up so many more conversations with so many different kinds of people, and I'm I, I just like that I'm getting different takes on things. Though my life is richer for it. So mm. I know that Bavisha and I have been sharing sort of one kind of bias, Michelle. I know that you're going to have a slightly different kind of story for me that's I'm going to have to try and keep a lid on my temper now, aren't I? So do you want to, do you want to share an experience that you've had recently? Yeah, so I think it's something that probably most female financial planners have come across at some point in their career. And uh, we we are fairly outnumbered by men. That's something we are all very aware of and we're all quite comfortable with. We, we understand. But there is a bias, I think, in, in men particularly that, that does come out at times. So I went to an event recently and there were three women and 12 men. Now, we'd all been invited to this event, so it was a corporate event. Now, whenever I've been to an event, I don't know about you, you go and you assume that everyone does the same job that you do because you've all been invited to the same event. So I still find it quite hard to swallow when a male advisor will come up to me and ask me if I am an advisor or a planner, financial planner. Now, I would just assume they are, but there's an assumption somewhere and there's a bias somewhere that I may be an administration team member, I may be a power planner, I'm not necessarily an advisor. Now, I think what strikes me is that was really recently. Now, I can remember years back in my early career where I used to have, you know, people come up to me and I was an investment manager at the time and ask me who secretary I was. And I could come back with things and I'm good at coming back with things because that kind of makes my blood boil. But the older I've got, I suppose, the less tolerant I am to it. So (laughs) You kind of, you know, I was asked the question, so are you a financial planner? And I would say, well, yes, I am the same as you. That's why I'm here. Mm. And and you just want to walk away because you don't want to get into that conversation. But when you're asked that then by about five, six, seven, eight people, there's an assumption there that you wouldn't be. And why why would I not be? And I, I find that really hard. Why Why would I not be? Mm. And and I could probably say that I could be more experienced than some of those people in that room. I could be more qualified than some of the people in that room. But that assumption really makes my blood boil. And then I think the bit that kind of got Julie when we were talking about it later is that one of the male advisors there had said to my female colleague that he could teach her a thing or two about how to be a financial planner with an assumption that that we 
that we may not know how to do our job properly. So I think from that point of view, that's their bias, isn't it, on us? Because that's definitely not a bias I would have. I can go into a room and be nervous that those people may not want to know what I've got to say or they'll know what I've got to say. So why would I say anything? But that bias just really makes me very upset. Yeah, it's, it's pushing all my buttons as well. And I think, like you said, you know, Michelle and I, and you, no doubt yourself as well, Bavisha, we've been around a little, a little bit. We're not spring chickens anymore. Yeah. Oh my! I might have taken that a little bit better in my twenties. It ain't flying now that I'm in my forties. It's not <laughs> flying at all. And I think what I'm interested in is because we've already touched on sort of gender biases, on race biases, on all these different biases, and we've all got them in play. And we've, you know, I've already owned up to some of mine. But Bisha, you've owned up to some of yours, Michelle. You've spoken about the one that we all as female financial advisors see every single bloody day of our lives. And the thing is, this is all going on in our heads. How is this influencing how we interact with people and the way that we represent the profession? Because if you think about, so you, Michelle, you were given the stat that only 16% of financial advisors are women. Okay. The rest are all men. And it's like, as a profession and as an industry, we're just not that good at engaging with women. Never mind a woman of color. Never mind a gay woman of color. And it's like, if we can't even get our heads around the fact that the other women in the room could be equal to us, how is that influencing the kind of service that we give to our clients and the kind of clients that we attract and how we're, how, how we're showing up in the world is my question. I'm not professing we have the answers in this episode, by the way, folks. This is a conversation starter. So, Babisha, what do you think as a profession, as an industry, as individuals, we, we could be doing differently to make sure that we are not excluding people unintentionally? I, Julie, I feel that we need to be more upfront in having those conversations. The first thing, the first rule when I entered this industry was not to assume. And most of these things that we assume that the other people thinks what we think as well in a conversation. So if we don't assume anything and we just go up to the person and just have that conversation like we did, we just had that conversation and we realized, well, it's not what we think it is that will just bridge the gap somewhat or maybe we'll just you know reduce the distance between people mainly women because I feel personally that they do have deeper conversation they don't want to just meet people and have short conversations and walk away they would like to mix with people know each other but the first step of that is not to assume I feel once we stop assuming, then we will make that first step of having approaching someone and having that conversation. If we're able to just do that, we will be able to overcome a lot of things that we that is only in our head and not actually physically present. I feel right, and I just think about, I'm trying to think of things that we could do now. We'll all have experienced this at some point, I suspect. Uh, you're in the one that all springs to my mind is buying a car. This is going back like 20 odd years ago. I was buying a car and I'd gone out. I had a husband there. So me and Brian had gone out to look at the car, but it's me that's buying the car. But the car salesperson wants to talk to Brian, who knows nothing about cars and has no money. And he's like, it's her that's buying the car. And obviously, by that point, I'd lost interest. I'm like, Sodji, I'll go and buy somebody else's bloody car. But I'm going to guess that we see this play out in financial services all the time. So what I'm wondering is, is if one of the listeners is presumably a woman, because it's the Women in Money Cafe, right? Mm -hmm. They find themselves in this situation where the financial professional individual is doing that thing where they're, they're, they're not treating them with the due care and respect that they should. They may be talking to the husband or they talk to the man or they're being dismissive. What, what, can, what can women do when this shit starts happening? Because that's what it is. Put you on spot, ladies. <laughs> I think they've got to talk up. You've got to speak up because it's very easy to sit back and not say anything. And I've been in the same situation as you, Julie. I've been out with my husband and we've been deciding. And I, I can't even remember exactly what item it was, but I can remember this time where the person was talking to my husband. 
and bless him, he's, he, he, he was, you know, he's not, make, he, doesn't, he doesn't make generally the financial decisions, that's what I would do. And he was talking to him and I would say something every now and again and, and he didn't want to talk to me, he didn't want to engage with me. And the thing was, he knew what I did for a job as well, but he didn't want to engage with me until, and I'm quite quiet, and in the end I looked up and went, if you don't speak to me, you're not going to get anything from us because I'm the one making the decision and I'm the one paying for it. And he didn't know what to do. Wow. And he, he sort of red started and started then talking to me. But it shouldn't take me to do that, no. to actually yeah. say. But it did, and I think that's what we have to do. Don't sit back and let someone do that to you. I've had friends who've been to advisors, been to banks, you know, been for all sorts and, and that's happened. And I think it is important to talk out, however uncomfortable that may be, mm. yes, it is to talk up because that person's making assumptions. Yeah. And I think you could argue that it's not, it's not our responsibility to correct this bias, but the thing is it, it's not the these men are being like outrageously sexist or they're deeply entrenched in being sex. It's a bias. And some of them, if we can just make them aware of, look, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've been trying to have a conversation with you and you keep talking to my husband when actually, you know, it's a joint decision or I am the decision maker. So yeah. would it be okay with you if you started addressing me as an equal? I think maybe you give them one shot. I think it's important, isn't it? Because I mean, I deal with, as you know, in, in work, as a lot of us do, I deal with clients who are divorcing. Mm -hmm. So I can be sat in a room with a husband and wife who are divorcing as, as a neutral party giving him information. Now, I'm quite comfortable with that at the beginning. I'll tell you, that was very hard for me. As someone who's been through a, a very challenging divorce, I have bias. I have bias. And I'm listening to what both of these people are saying. And it, it takes a lot to not do that so I had to really do some deep thinking before I decided that was what I would offer as part of what I do but actually it's quite refreshing because actually if you sit back and you just listen mm -hmm. you see it from a different point of view if I'd gone in with a point of view whereas actually I'm the woman I had a challenging divorce so therefore you must be the enemy because you're a man that's a very very difficult place to be mm. And you see it from a different point of view. So I think it is about, one, challenging our own biases mm -hmm. and then also pointing out to people if they have a bias because they may not realise it. No, I think the ones that you can change are the ones that they don't realise. I think what I'd, li what I'd really like to do right now is bring in something, Bavisha, something you were talking about before we pressed record and this idea of the boxes and the normal and this yeah. started a hub with me Googling and the fact that Google doesn't have the answer for people like me, but we don't need to go there. But, but would you mind just sort of kind of, do you remember what you were saying? Yes, I just, I was part of another conversation recently and they were talking about how we act and what our beliefs are. And it's not just our own beliefs while we are growing up and all the information we've gathered since till now. We do carry all the biases or beliefs of our of the generations before us, so great grandfathers, grandfathers, etc., and that leads us to having a belief of certain type, and we feel that belief is standard, and we box it. So, for example, a normal family is a husband, wife, a boy, and a girl. That's the standard box, if I call it. And if anybody is outside that box, something is either missing or you don't unnecessarily tick all the boxes in that certain box of normality, and you just call that as normal. That's a standard family. Two adults and two children, that's a standard family. And who are they? A husband, wife, and two kids. If you have anything outside of that, you are outside of that normality. And then people start treating you differently and that's what I was talking about that if you don't fit that normal being gay being women being women of color all of this myself I never fit in that box I never ever think oh I, I detach myself from those conversations 
because then I have to put myself in a difficult place to make other people understand, look at their reaction, either confront them, what they are saying is wrong, and they live in the 18th century, not the current century, or I just say, I've had enough for the day. I'm just going to, whatever I say, it's not going to make any difference, and I walk away. So I go either or, either I correct them, saying bring them up to speed with the current reality, or I just had enough and I walk away. So it's either of the two, and I never fit those boxes. My my partner doesn't fit those boxes. My partner just like, I'm just going to put it straight right on on his face, saying, what what do you think this is all about? (laughs) And what do you think you're doing here? But sometimes I just feel like, I've, I've had it. Sometimes I go and just correct them saying, you are not right. I was sharing an example with you earlier. If I go to a bank and I see an Asian man at the counter and I see a white man at the counter, who will I go to? And I'll actually go to a white man because it will save me all the grief and facial expressions and everything that I had to go through. Instead, I'll just go to a white man who will not bother whether I'm gay, straight or whatever, a woman of color or not. And it will just treat me like any other customer and that's fine. But if I go to an Asian and he said, oh, because that was one of my experiences, genuinely. I went to a bank to open an account and say, oh, are you married? I'm like, no, I have a partner. Oh, what partner? And I just heard the whole conversation and we said, oh, never mind. This is what it is. And then we'll just open the account and just go out. I'm talking about years ago. I don't know if it's going to be the same. So that's a whole experience and everything just comes back to if you don't fit into that box, you are outside the box. And the reason why we are talking about this is that so many people would feel like this but never say anything. And it's not right not to say. It's just to start that conversation. No, thank you for that. Thank you. And I think because what I really want to bring in is what you were saying is like, but you don't fit in the box. It's that sense of, do I belong? Mm. And that is a basic human need. We all need to feel like we belong to part of the tribe. But I think who actually fits that normal box anymore? Honestly speaking, I don't know. Even coming from Asian background, if you speak to one Asian person and they say how your family sees something, you will find so many conversations, be it people like me, actually born and brought up in one of those countries and coming here, or people who are actually born here in that community would, would tell you otherwise, that it is just not right to be, it's just not right for someone to be treated in such a way because people, nobody is normal. None of my friends have children and they, they kept kept on being asked, oh, when are you going to have children? Well, it's not your business, is it? Whether I have a child or not. Oh, you're divorced. Oh, that's sad. Well, no, it's not. Actually, I came out of a very bad relationship. It's really good for me. But things like that, it's just, it just boils my blood constantly and it's like oh you don't know how to cook and these are the small 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 conversation you have in in our community oh you don't cook well oh you're not married oh you're divorced or you don't have a child i mean it's none of these are your business i'm not coming to feed you or i'm not living with you or i'm not you know you're not financially dependent on you or whatever what is it's my life at the end of the day however i want to i will is these conversations you constantly have every single day and it just numbs your brain to the point that I don't want to interact with these people anymore. So if I just come out. It, uh, if, if the assumption that we make is challenging someone's identity. So I'm listening to you here. Do you speak there? So you don't cook. You're not married. You don't have kids. You're divorced. And what I'm saying, what kind of failure are you that you're not ticking any of these boxes? What is wrong with you? And you're like, I'm actually doing really good. I don't feel like a failure at all. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. It just uh, knocks down your confidence as a person because you don't feel fill all the boxes or tick all the boxes of the so-called normal box. You're having to justify yourself. Okay, right. Keep me on track, ladies, because I'm in danger of going to get militant (laughs) because I've had an idea. I've had an idea because you've made me think it's all these talk talk about boxes. See the bloody boxes that do my head in. Right. The application forms, where it's 
are you single? Are you separated? Are you widowed? Are you divorced? Are you this? Are you that? I'm like, who needs to know? Because I can take quite a few of those boxes, but the one that gets me really, really irate is because I work with widows. And it's like, well, are they, that they still think in their head they're married, but you're confronted with this bit of paper where you're having to tick a box to declare that they're not here anymore. What purpose is that serving for most of the forms that have that? So no. I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting we start a little campaign that we stop ticking unnecessary boxes. Next time you're faced with a box that you have to tick, ask yourself, do they actually need that information? And if they don't, don't tick the bloody box. I don't know. Am I out of line? No. I think I've I've had to fill forms in in the past. I I don't have a standard past history, you know. I'm not what you would class as, as normal. And I can remember one form I had to fill in. I think it was when I was actually helping out my daughter's school when they were younger. And it was your, they called it CRB, so your enhanced check criminal check for working near children this form was the bane of my life because everything on this form I had the bit that you had to add extra information for so it wasn't just the point of you know so during my childhood there was a an adoption of some kind and there was this that and the other and I had to prove when my name changed and when this happened when that happened I don't know all of it because I was very young for some of it. And I had to provide documentary evidence for all of this. And I can remember going to my mum and sitting with my mum and saying, when did this change? When did that happen? And she said, I, I don't know. You know, the exact date. And this took me months to actually complete this form. And when it went back, they came back and went, no, we want information on this. And, you know, I've been divorced. So they wanted that too. They wanted everything. And I just thought, you are putting up such a barrier. All I wanted to do was help with my children's swimming lessons. Mm. <laughs> that was it. That's all I wanted to do was help with the children's swimming lessons of my friend's children in the pool. Yeah. But because those boxes, I couldn't fit in all those boxes and had to write in all the other boxes underneath for various different things. It put me off. And yes, I did get it eventually, but it made me feel like, well, clearly I don't conform to any person. Your other. You must have applying. Yeah. I also object to declaring whether I'm a miss, missus, or a miss. I've been all of them at some point. I don't, I'm like, who, how does that help anybody knowing which one I am? And like, if I can avoid it and just not put it, I will. But sometimes you've got an online form and it insists there's a drop down box and you've got to pick one. Yes, it won't let you go ahead at all cost. Who's this serving? I, I can't help but feel that we've gone off on a tangent now because yes. oh, I got a bit ranty. So I apologize for that. So just as we sort of bring, thing, bring things around to a close now, just wondering, Michelle, what's been your sort of really big takeaway from this episode? I think it's definitely the point that don't make assumptions either about other people or let people make assumptions about you. And then we'd all have conversations, which actually we find out that none of us are normal. We've all got weird things in our lives. We've all got things that have happened. We've all got views, rightly or wrongly, but don't make assumptions. And I think that's probably the biggest thing to take because I do it we all make assumptions before we meet people as we walk into a room and if we don't it's quite nice to go in with a fresh pair of eyes and ears and and just listen and then go from what's around you but it is hard I get that right but Visha what's the what's the one thing that you want people to take away from this episode I just feel to that people should start making those conversations just adding to what Michelle just said, it's very difficult to tackle your own bias. First, to realize that you have one. And second, to actually do something about it. But rather than, you know, putting yourself to say, oh, pin it down on yourself that you have to address it, you can have those small conversations which will lead to a change that you want to see in yourself or maybe in others, I don't know. But those small conversations is a starting point and that's my takeaway I'm going to do that going forward right 
I think probably the thing for me is just it's that awareness. Once we're aware, then we can start to take action, can't we? But it's easy to spot it in other people, but are you as aware of what your own are? Or maybe that's my challenge to listeners. So, Bavisha, just as we're kind of wrapping up now, when we've had guests on, we like to ask them a random question at the end, just to get a, a little, get to know them a little bit better. Okay. And I'm just curious if, if I was to ask you, what's the last thing you Googled? Then what would be the answer? And is it broadcastable? I was actually, well, funny enough, I was, I was trying to find an answer for you, how to get a lost page in Word. That was my last Google search, which I just clicked a picture and sent it to you. Try this, Julie. All right. That I'm... was my, my last Google search, actually. But I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> but it's already did help. I'm so surprised. <laughs> I'm going to have to come back to my, my, I'm having a bit of a tech nightmare today, listeners, but Bavisha was trying to help me. All right, look, thank you very much for that. Bavisha, thank you so much for joining us and your contribution. I'm sure that the listeners have got as much out of listening to your chat as I have. So thank you for that. Thank you for having me, Julie. All right, thank you. Michelle, thank you as always for your contribution and well done for not punching anybody. <laughs> it was I mean, lovely to meet you, Michelle, as well. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I mean at the event that Michelle was at, obviously not at our course because we're quite a friendly. Bunch. No, I'm quite polite. <laughs> I really, I just, I hope that today's episode is giving you food for thought, just to go out there and let's let's make the world just a little bit more inclusive. So thank you very much for listening, and until next time, please take care of yourselves. <laughs>